more respectful that way. Yeah, yeah, um, I stopped too. Not many journalists have respect, so I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, I'm, I'm really. Can okay. you tell? I'm still. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, you're like, how do I go about this? Um, I just. Is it on? <laughs> okay. Um, what era? Uh, what era did you serve? The I was, in the, I was in the armor division, and I served during the uh, Desert Shield to the Storm era. Okay. Um, now, when you went over there, I'm sure you saw stuff. I mean, you can, would you mind sharing like some of the stuff that you saw or some of the stuff that happened over there? Well, over there was, uh, during Desert Shield, it was really different. Um, there was several instances where there were fights for food, masses of masses of people rushing trucks, and we were, as soldiers, our mission was to guard the trucks, to give out so much food, because if you just tried to hand food or, or allow them to come up, it's, it's historia. Everybody's coming up on the truck. Somebody's going to fall on a child, somebody get hurt, so we had to hand out food. And it was my first time, I never experienced anything like that. Someone desperate for food, a mother and a child and a father fighting for a bag of rice. You know, the U.S. were so spoiled over here. I see so many people throw stuff away. And to, and to go over there and to see someone getting a physical fist fight for a bag of rice so their family can eat for a month. It just gave me a whole different perspective. Um, I had to deal with, at that time, we had to deal with um, suicide bombers, bomb sighting kids, walking into our camps, making a decision to fire. And it wasn't my decision. I was given an order. And um, prior to me going into an armor division, I went into sniper school training. So they would bounce me back and forth between um, infantry and armor division because I was versatile. I could drive a tank, fire a tank, as well as pick fire someone off at a thousand up. yards. Exactly. And um, remember, I got a I got a call to be shot, and it was on a child. I remember looking into the child's eyes, and calling him back and saying, "Sir, that's a child." And it was like, "This is their direct, direct order." Being in yourself, you know, when you're given a direct order, you don't have an option. And I'm 45 now. Every day, probably for the last 20 years, that child ends up in my head every single day. I never forget about it. I play this scene a thousand times. The vapor, the shot, the feeling before. After, doesn't go away. It's a child that was defenseless, that couldn't have done really any harm, or that was told, hey, you need to do this. Exactly. Um, now, due to that event of you um, taking that shot, mm -hmm. which I understand there's a lot of emotion when it comes to being a sniper. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of just raw emotion, and you have to be really strong. When you went in, you're 100% at health, right? Absolutely. When you came out, did you have PTSD? Any, did you sustain injuries? Did Actually, they... after I came out, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Okay. I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, I was completely emotionally distraught. I was completely emotionally raw, as you learned in basic. The soldier never shows his emotion. So I learned for a long time not to show my emotion. Very hard, even several years later. I mean, the last playing the humorous to even show any emotion now. Um, as far as as far as uh, when you were over there, you, did you own a home, or were you were you in the barracks, or were you, I was in the barracks? You were in the barracks. Okay. Um, did you ever hear of any of your fellow soldiers losing their houses while they were over there? Absolutely. Explain a little bit about that and maybe the way that you <clears throat> saw them react to the news of, hey, my, I don't have a house. They came back home and they're like, what do you mean I don't have a house? I've been in this house three years. They come back home, they don't have a house, there's no explanation, there's a notice on the door, the 
wife is, is in a hotel. I mean, one of my buddies, I was on a plane, we were just coming back from Iraq. We were on our way back to the base. And he got the call from his wife. He's like, what do you mean the house is gone? And just the whole stunned look like. And look, he was just, I just lost my house. My wife in my tower was standing outside, waiting for a cab. And I don't know what I'm going to do, and I don't know where I'm going to put them. And a bunch of us in our unit, because we're tight. When one of us suffer, we all band together. We're brothers. You know, I've been living in the barracks. I'm a single, so. I took a portion of my pay, helped him and his wife get, get placed in, into some temporary, like, uh, executive-type housing until they can get things situated. Um, when you went when you went through basic and, and there was advanced schooling and stuff like right. that, and then you went into sniper AIT. school, stuff right. like, well, AIT, and then mm -hmm. you went into sniper school, right. um, your unit in Desert Storm and Desert Shield, there was not a lot of casualties, but there were quite a few, you know, there was enough to, to call some casualties. Right. Um, did you, how many, how, how many of those casualties were in your unit or affiliated with your company or battalion within, you know, and how did that affect your, your thought process of, of the people there because they were killing American soldiers and fellow members of the armed forces? Well, my unit, I was a, I was a, um, I was a team leader. I had four guys in my unit get shot. I had another guy in my battalion lose his leg. I had another guy in my company lose an arm. It made me focus more on direction, and getting guys more battle ready, um, more combat ready. I just, I, and again at that time, I learned to shut my emotions up. So I learned just to not show any kind of emotion to do the job at hand. You got your orders to come home. What was the feeling? I mean, I know there was you were not supposed to show your emotions, and that's the way we were trained. Was okay. We're not to show crying. We're not to cry. We're not to show. You know, we're just supposed to always be strong and be faceless, and you know, kind of just be there. When you got your orders to go home, and they told you, okay, we're done with you. We don't need you anymore. You're gonna go home to your family or your, right. you know, your mom, dad, your right. sisters, whatever, whatever right. the case may be. Um, what was your emotion then? Did, I mean, did you cry? Were, were you showing emotion, or were you still just kind of stone-faced, like, I'm gonna... I was happy. <laughs> As uh, most people. I got on the plane, and I remember going to the airport, just staring at my paper. I couldn't believe I was going home. And when I got on the plane, I looked at the stewardess and I said, I'm going home. I said, oh. and she looked at me and she smiled. I was in my dress, I was in my class in uniform. And she says, you were in Desert Storm, do not you? Yes, I was. What was it like? I don't know. They talked about it, just let us do that. And, yeah. and, she's, and, they, and the stewardess walked over to her and said, what's the first thing you want? I said, a pillow and a shot of JD. Because at that point, <laughs> that's what I needed to calm my nerves. Yeah. Um, but it was very different when I landed. The feeling of getting on the plane versus to get off was very different. It was more of a feeling. When I got off the plane, there was no ticket parade. There was no one to meet me. See, I'm not married. It was raining. My cousin was stuck in traffic on his way to come get me. And I remember seeing people go, Daddy, here's a soldier. And he looked, and the father looked at me, and his reaction to me wasn't like, thank you for your service. It was like, oh, that's nice. So I felt Unappreciated. Like, absolutely. Like, the American public just didn't have a clue of what soldiers go through on a day-to-day -day basis. If you had, if you had to um, explain to somebody um, <laughs> in one word, sum up what it's like to be a soldier and what it's like to have to take an order, 
that could potentially land you in prison for the rest of your life, that could be considered a war crime in, in many countries' eyes. Right. How would you sum it up in one word, what it's like being an American soldier in the United States military? So you, so you don't, you, so you feel maybe a little bit comfortable. I went over there and I had a 14 year old kid walking down with the bomb on him, with guns, pistols, grenades, everything, you name it. He looked like he was Rambo ready to come in and destroy us. And he's walking down our fob and we were giving him a command to stop. And he kept coming and he kept walking and he wasn't listening. And our translator walked out to him to prevent him from walking any closer. And the kid blew himself up, or he was on the cell phone and mm -hmm. someone hit the button and he disappeared, along with our translator. <laughs> Understanding that you're a, sni a sniper, was taking that shot for the 14 year old, would you, would you blame that shot, of sh that one shot that you took against that kid? As with the 14 year old with me having post traumatic stress and just being, just having it replay over and over again, would you say that's the reason why you have post traumatic stress and you it just repeat because of the fact that it was so intensely real and it was something you didn't want to do but you had to do it because you were ordered and because of the fact that you, if you wouldn't have, you would have gone to prison for the rest of your life for disobeying an order. And, and you know, if you wouldn't have taken that kid out, he could have killed a soldier, and then you would have been going to prison for, you know, hand in hand, like pretty much killing the soldier. Yeah. You know, how um, how would you say that that makes you feel like? How did you deal with that? As far as like, like as far as um, when I got out. Yeah, when he got out, like, and, and you say it replayed in your head. How did it? How did it? You know, when you got out, were you like real sketchy? Were you real jumpy about kids? Were you, were you just, I mean, because there's some nights where I'll lay down and I just cry myself to sleep because it just replays over and over again. Like the kid didn't need to die. There was a way to do it other than what we did, other than what the commander had said. And I would have gone to prison right. just to make sure that kid didn't get right. shot. To this day, if I'm anywhere in public, a child makes a loud noise behind me, I instantly jump. Still. And it's some like 15, 20 years later. 20 years later, I still jump. I hear I get a kid squeal. Still jump. Uh, car door shuts too hard. I jump. I feel like the military has marked me in military for the rest of my life no matter what kind of medication they come up with, whatever science formula they come up with, I'm take it away. It's something I'm going to have to do. Whether I want to or not. When you, you know, when you come in situations like this, and agencies bounce you around like a yo-yo, Technically, I'm supposed to be over in CAS and a veteran three bed because the manager isn't coming until Monday. I have to stay where I'm at until that my number comes up to move over there. And I look and I'm like, this is what we fought for. with the questions. I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for answering the questions. I want to thank you for everything that you've ever done for the nation.
I say your name? Oh, my name yeah. is George Lamar. And um, you said you were Army? Army. Thank you again for your service and for your time and answering our questions. Got all day. It's always about serving. I found out even when you get out, you still serve. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. <laughs> Sorry, I don't to get some. No, Hopefully good. that works a little bit. Maybe we can find one more person. So I got more in depth. Play. I can I can do it without getting. Like, I man, we are failing you guys. You fought for us. It's not even that. I don't even think that it's your. You, should, you shouldn't be treated this way. I'm but, not gonna allow this to happen. But the thing is, is that this the United States government. This is what they did to us. They turned us. They pretty much said, you know, that, and when you get into the military, they teach you. This is my rifle. This is my gun. You know, that's they turn you into a killing machine. They say, okay, it's okay to kill somebody. You know, it's okay to get a weapon and point it at somebody and take their life. And then they say, okay, well, we're not gonna demilitarize you. We're gonna just let you go. Then we're not gonna put you through briefings. We're not gonna let you say, you know, we're not gonna. Okay, this is what you need to do to get back into normal life. They say. Here's your papers. Here's your last paycheck. Have a nice life. They don't send us the counseling. They say, you know, when I got debriefed, it was, here's your papers. Here's your paycheck. Have a good day. Nice. Thank you for serving. You know, that's all we get is paycheck, papers, and thank you for serving. They send us out here and then expect us to function normally. You know, in the the, the time that I've been in the military, I can't have, a, I can't function. I can't have a normal relationship with anybody. I try to. I try to be nice to everybody, but there's always one time. Triggers, you know, and, and puts us here, and we have no choice because we can't work at a job because of the noise. You know, same problem with him. I had noise problems. I, I still have noise problems. Loud bangs, fireworks. I, first person to hit the ground, covering my head. You know, and it's it's uh, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, that four month fish chip is valuable on its own, right? Right? Yeah. I was like, yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. I can buy multiple cigarettes. Thank you very much. Can I take a snow photo? Snow photo? Can I take a snow photo before you go?